Well, welcome to Farm Dog and welcome to Jackie Tinker. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This is very exciting. <laughs> well, I'm excited to talk to you. Jackie is the owner of Ar Arcadia Working Aussies, um, an Australian shepherd breeder and a stock dog trainer. And I should point out here, you have the very enviable website URL of stockdogtrainer.com. <laughs> I'm kind of lucky that was still there when I got it. <laughs> yeah, you either jumped on it early or nobody thought of that one yet. I think nobody thought of it because I've only had it for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that right? Wow. Huh? I know. That... I was really surprised it was still there. Well, that's wonderful. So <laughs> everyone can just keep that in mind. Stockdogtrainer.com will take okay. you to Arcadia Working Aussies and uh, Jackie's business and, and Jackie's experience and history. Um, Jackie is also uh, on the Stock Dog Program Committee of the Australian Shepherd Club of America, and uh, we may get a chance to talk about that later on. Yeah. But first, Jackie, I just wonder if you could, uh, beyond that very rudimentary ex introduction I just did for you, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your history and uh, your history with Australian Shepherds, that'd be great. Okay. I met my first Australian Shepherd when I was 14 years old, and I really didn't think it was a very attractive dog. I was really obsessed with Golden Retrievers and German Shepherds and things like that, and I'd never seen an Aussie before. But I met this very wonderful lady who is my mentor to this day, Dana McKenzie, and she's really big in the Australian Shepherd working world. And she introduced me to the breed, and I fell in love with them because of their loyalty their they didn't run away because I had a little dog that liked to run away and it drove me crazy and they their constant devotion to their humans and then also the that she worked her dogs on a ranch so I got to see my first working dogs and she actually gave me my first Aussie raisin and that kind of hooked me in and I got into trialing and I was the first junior handler to put a working trial championship on an Aussie in the ASCA program and that was it. I've had an Aussie ever since then, and now I have more than one. <laughs> I took some time off in college to and, and raised a family for a while and took away a uh, time away from competition and training, but I've been back for the last eight years now, so getting into it big time. And right now I have a podcast, The Instinctive Australian Shepherd, which we talk about working Aussies. I also have the website Working Aussie Source, and we could talk about that a little bit later when we're talking about looking for working Aussies. Um, I train stock dogs at my place. I do lessons, which I prefer to do lessons over board and trains because I really feel like when you're training a dog, it's not just the dog that needs training. The handler needs training and the dogs are great teachers. And if you do a board and train and you don't train your own dog, which is fine if you want to do that, but you miss out on some of that teaching and that learning from your dog. So I prefer to do in-person lessons and I do camps and like four or five day ranch camps and stuff like that post trials wow there's a ton of stuff i want to ask you about all those things <laughs> go um, ahead could i could i ask you just to pull your mic down and like point it just below your chin a little bit just getting a little, Is that even better? A little lower yeah even a little lower maybe how's that there we go perfect we're just getting right. a little noise there so um now th this person who introduced you to the Aussie to begin with her name again was Dana mckenzie Dana McKenzie. And um, did she introduce you to the Australian Shepherd in the context of uh, being a herding dog and, and doing stock work? Or was it just as a pet companion? I think she showed up at a class that we were, my brother and I were in 4-H and we were in 4-H in Minnesota. And then in the middle of our classes for dog training and the dog project, which 4-H is an amazing program and ultimately led me to Aussies we had to move to Texas. We were, and um, we didn't know anybody. And our instructor in, in Minnesota while I was crying and hysterical as a teenager is, she said, hey, if you don't have a dog project in Texas where you are, just start one, you know enough. <laughs> so I believed her <laughs> and I'm bold, I've always been bold. So we did start a little dog project in Texas and we opened up our little class to anybody in the town. And she showed up with her Aussie and a friend showed up with their Aussie and after the class she just talked about how she's a professional trainer and i was kind of embarrassed you know because i was 14 and didn't really know much and she invited me out to her ranch and we became fast friends 
you know, and her primary work is working at ranch. You know, she's worked cattle ranches. Um, she was one of these amazing women who worked on cattle ranches alongside all these cowboys. And she would live out in the middle of nowhere with all these cows taking care of them and, and working her dogs with the cows. And I, I just, we just have been fast friends ever since. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned that you weren't all that impressed with the looks of the Australian Shepherd. I thought and... they were ugly, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> do, now, do you still kind of think that, or have you learned no. to appreciate the, their oh look gosh. in a different way? I found, when raised in the dog that Dana gave me, um, she attached herself to me immediately. And, and I thought she was a nice dog and everything, but then a couple weeks into it, and she looked up at me with those eyes, and then your soul's kind of connected our souls kind of connected and it was she was the most beautiful creature on the planet ever since then and i just love aussies i think they're beautiful so it's just yeah. you know when you've never seen something before oftentimes you're not attracted to it or you don't know what it is right but the australian shepherd does have kind of a unique look which i think is what endears it to some people and why why they become so popular you know even as yeah. companion animals yeah yeah, the Merles with the blue eyes. There, everybody wants one of those, right? So, right, right. Which is funny because I don't have a Merle. <laughs> I have all solids, <laughs> all blacks, and one red. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the uh, Australian Shepherd and its virtues as a working dog. Maybe if you know a little bit about the history of the of the Australian Shepherd, you can go back and give us some of that too. Um, how yeah. did, how did it become to be so associated with American ranches? Yeah, and it's, it's contrary to the name Australian Shepherd. They didn't actually come from Australia. I think some uh, there's different stories about how that happened, but it came. they came over with Australian sheep, I think, and that's kind of what they were associated with, were the sheep from Australia. Um, they actually came over with Basque Shepherds who were from Spain-ish area near Spain. So the Australian part just really doesn't fit at all. <laughs> but they're actually American. They, they were developed in the American Southwest, California, Colorado. That that area um, is where they were developed. It's not a very old breed. The breed is, I think, about probably 100 years old. The breed registry, ASCA, has only been around for, I believe, it's 65 years now. They were registered with National Stock Dog for a few years before that. But it's a very young breed. Um, and they originally started out as working dogs on working ranches. And I think their unique color, the Merles, um, really kind of stood out to people. The Native Americans called them ghost dogs because of their blue eyes. And they had some history there in the Southwest. But they just started working ranches and a lot of cattle ranches. And back in the, I started in the 80s, late 80s, Aussies were one of the more premier cattle working breeds. Border Collies were still sheep dogs primarily back then they were starting to make their transition at that point to being cattle bred dogs but aussies really um were able to handle cattle and that's kind of how they got on the farm and ranch and they're also really smart and very in tune to their families their owners or whatever they kind of own us more than we own them but um there are stories their protectiveness is also unique to their breed over other working breeds they're highly protective and territorial and there was a story and i don't remember who it was if it was um jay sizzler or not but that there was a, a guy that went around the rodeos and stuff and he would tell people he'd put a 20 dollar bill or a 100 dollar bill in the back of his truck and he put his aussie in the truck and he'd say if you get the money you can have it and nobody ever got the money you know <laughs> and they were hauled around to rodeos and were there to protect the gear that's that was part of their job and that's what they were valued for and unfortunately it's a struggle now because people don't value that in a dog it's not desired in a dog to be protective anymore dogs aren't expected to be more than dogs <laughs> and and not protective at all and so the, the people with aussies that don't really understand the breed really struggle with that because they're it's been breed bred out of some lines of it and people are breeding it away away from it more and more all the time this protectiveness but it's still there some in some of these lines and some of these dogs you're going to get that genetic protectiveness which can be a problem for them but um as far as working style they're what we call loose eyed dog which means they like to work close so loose eyed dog breeds are like aussies healers German Shepherds, your Briards, those kind of dogs are loose-eyed dogs. Your tight-eyed, which is the opposite, 
are border collies and kelpies primarily and they work they're more comfortable way off the bubble and much farther away aussies and loose eyed dogs like to work as close as possible so you have to teach them to communicate with their stock and learn to turn their power off so they don't scare the stock um and but but that i think is a beautiful thing that a lot of people overlook the ability to communicate with that stock and to be working up close and the stock not be afraid of them and um so that's that's one of the things I actually appreciate about them, which a lot of people kind of get frustrated about. Hmm. Do you think that that tendency to work close and you know not far off the bubble, as you say, it's a great phrase, <laughs> um, it lends itself better to cattle work than to other livestock, sheep and goats, or can it be adapted to either situation? It can be adapted to either situation. Cattle, typically now, not always. If you've got wild cows. Their bubble can be really big too, <laughs> but yeah. you know, typically in more domesticated cows, they can move, they can work in really closely, and the cows aren't worried about it. And then also, some cows have to be told very distinctly to move <laughs> by the dogs using a grip or a bite. But with sheep, if you dog break your sheep, like my sheep and my goats, they're used to dogs. They're being worked by dogs all the time. So their bubble is much smaller. I and mean, if it's a strange dog, they get very nervous and their flight zone mm -hmm. gets much bigger. So it just really depends on what you're doing with your dog and what kind of work you need them to do, that kind of thing. So like border collies and kelpies, those more tight eyed dogs are a little bit better at going out far and seeing stock from a farther distance. Their eyesight, the way that they, they, they see movement, they can pick up things farther away than say more of a loose eyed dog can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it was suggested to me, I think maybe even on a previous podcast here, that um, a loose eyed dog can have the advantage of just not being having such a drilled down focus that they they just see more broadly, and so they don't leave stock behind, or they don't, you know, yes. they they see it a, a wider point of view of the world, I guess. Whereas the the um, border collies and kelpies and that sort of thing can be so zeroed in that they tend to miss things. Do you, is that true in your experience? I think it's a possibility. I think the sense of group, which I'm so glad you brought that up because that sense of group, that holding the group together, seeing the whole group, any breed can have it. Um, and it's something that I feel like breeders need to be breeding for more than they are. They don't really talk about that uh, when breeding. We'll talk about how strong they are in the head or they can heal, which is great. But if I send them into the woods, they need to not come back until all the cows or sheep are out of the woods, that whole sense of looking for things and seeing things. And I think you're right. I think the loose eyed dogs can have that wider perspective because they're not locked in. They don't have that eye, that tight eye, which is that kind of when they stare the sheep, like a border collie will stare at a sheep. They get locked in sometimes and you're right. They'll just see the small group here or even lock in on one, which they bred that in for a reason and they, you know, in Scotland, where border collies are from for hundreds and hundreds of years, they bred that for a purpose. Um, but I think sometimes it can be a little bit detrimental to what you're doing if the dog can't unlock themselves, <laughs> that they stay locked in. Mm -hmm. How do you go about breeding for that whole package that you mentioned? You know, not just good header, good healer, you know, but understands the whole job in a more comprehensive way. Can you breed for particular traits like um you know that th these two dogs both do that pretty well so we'll breed them or is that like too superficial and what you need to be looking for is just generalized intelligence or de generalized uh stock sense to, to use it for lack of a better term it's a really good question um so I have a I have a bunch of different dogs from different lines and they have different bloodlines totally and they all work very differently because Aussies like I said before is a young breed so we don't have as consistent of working style across the breed as maybe say border collies sheep dog border collies that have been bred for hundreds of years for you know those they're all very similar um, <clears throat> so I have one who has an outstanding sense of group. I mean, he never leaves anything behind. It's it's there. And so my goal is to take him and breed him to other dogs that have senses, a, a good sense of group. I have some that have medium sense of group and a poor sense of group, you know, because, and I, I really do think it's genetic and it comes from specific bloodlines or specific dogs. And so I, I, 
as with anything, you try to breed the best to the best and then do a little bit of line breeding in there so you know exactly what you're going to come up with in the end. And so there's like, it's hard because you don't want to pick a dog that has just one good trait. <laughs> you kind of need one that has a lot of good traits um, to it, you know, so. Right. Can that sense of group be trained or is it uh, you have it or you don't sort of thing? No, I, I think you can train for it. Ultimately, the instinct is the strongest thing you have, but I have one that has um, her sense of group is affected by the fact that she's so worried about what's going on at the front of the group that she doesn't want to stay at the back. <laughs> ah. And so I have trained her. She, her sense of group is much better. Uh, she's a six-year-old dog now, and, and I use her on a regular basis to bring my stuff up, and she does a really good job of – her group wasn't terrible, but it wasn't as strong as my other dog. That's just totally natural. So I did train it. You can train it and you, you, you habituate your behaviors. If you're most of the time on the ranch, you're doing the same stuff. You're bringing the stock out. I do rotational grazing. So twice a day, they once a day they go out and once a day they come back in. So they're doing the same chore every day. So when they learn that chore, then they become better at managing it properly, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So if you're sending them daily to do a chore that requires a strong group sense, sense of group, then just naturally they're going to become pretty good at that. Just by with train, well, not naturally, but with training and experience, yeah. the more experience you get your dogs, the way better, obviously your dogs are going to be. Okay. Let me ask you just to back up a little bit to when the ancestors of today's Australian Shepherd were first brought over by um, Bosque sheep herders. Do you, can you pinpoint the time at which not, we had a distinct breed that you could call, give a new name to? Um, and was there any crossbreeding into other breeds of, of working dogs um, in, in that period? You know, those kind of slightly undefined Bosch sheep herders dogs for right. any crosses out to other breeds to eventually produce the Australian Shepherd? I am not the Australian Shepherd history expert, <laughs> so I'm going to pull from what I've been told and what people have sure. shared with me. Um, I think obviously at the beginning, when you first are developing a breed, there's going to be some crossbreeding in there. There's going to be, if you don't really know what this dog is and you breed it to another dog that looks similar, but it might not be similar. And, you know, there's going to be that. There are certain of our lines that have more of a border collie type style working to them. They, they work, you know, more like a border collie. So obviously somewhere back there, there's probably some border collie. There's some that work a little bit, you know, closer or whatever. But when you're developing a breed, there's always going to be some crossbreeding in there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, because I wasn't around in, in the pictures. There's very few pictures of what they look like back in the day. So I can't right. answer that one as clearly okay. as you might want. No, I appreciate that, that though. That's a good thought. Um, and, I, and I think it's got to be true that, mm -hmm. you know, before we got so concerned about breed clubs and def putting definitions on every dog, that there had to be... Well, the, the priority was, does this dog work? Does this dog do what I need it to do? And does that right. one do what that farmer right. needs it to do? Well, let's cross them, you know? So. Yes, exactly. But it's a highly sensitive and uh, volatile subject when you talk about crossing <laughs> breeding dogs. And, uh, you know. Yes. So, but yes, it has to be that way because ranchers right. didn't care. They wanted the dog to work. They didn't care if they had papers. Right. I found out how sensitive that was, uh, <laughs> by the way, recently when I... I the last podcast episode was uh, about the McNabb dog, and uh, I I got some pretty strong responses back about you know allowing them in act, that dog to be defined as anything different than a border collie. Um, so, but but That's what I interesting <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> if what, you've ever what, seen a McNabb they don't look look anyway <laughs> right right or some cross of of existing working dogs in the u.s yeah. but again, that's kind of exactly my point one of my favorite questions to ask guests is you know when every new dog breed comes from crosses of breeds whether intentional or not you know right. so um when when does a dog come into its own as a defined breed and yeah well when you get a bunch of people together that create a breed standard i think that right. say this is what they have to look like this is how they have to act and then they start registering them 
and then putting criteria on it. With ASCA, the Australian Shepherd Club of America, which is the largest breed club in the world, that's a single breed club, and it's a registry as well. So it's not a breed club that's like, say, part of AKC. It's its own registry. We have the most stringent rules of anyone for breeding. Every single dog has to be genetically tested to verify the parentage. So that's when, you know, that started, you know, I don't know how long ago, but um, they, that's when you start having the defined definition, no crossbreeding, no outcrossing. This is where we're going to be. This is our breed. We have enough foundation. Part of the problem is you need to have enough foundation stock as well, because you'll eventually run into a tree that doesn't branch anymore if you don't have enough foundation stock to start with. Right. So. And and there's a breed also called the Hanging Tree Dogs. I'm sure you've probably heard of them. Yep. They actually started as Hanging Tree Australian Shepherds back in the 80s. Um, and then Gary Erickson, who owned Hanging Tree Australian Shepherds, took one of his Aussies, Black Bear, and then bred it with Border Collies and Kelpies. And I don't know if he put Healers or Catahoulas in there, but they have their own Hanging Tree breed of dog as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. It's, it's absolutely fascinating, you know, because we – I think that as just that people are just inherently want to be part of a group or a tribe. And so once you put uh, a description on what that tribe is now, any cross out is automatically controversial, but our tribe came from our group, our particular club came from the fact that we crossed other breeds, you know, we, mm -hmm. that's how we got to where we are, but so it's just a fascinating topic. Um, I appreciate your perspective yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, tell me, tell me more about the personality of the Australian Shepherd and what, um, just what it is generally, but also in your work with Australian Shepherds and training them for, uh, work on your place, what you like to see, um, okay. in personality and temperament yeah. and that sort of thing. So, uh, we talked about the protectiveness, you know, at my place, I've got some from very, very strong protective lines. So the zombies will not be crossing my fence if the apocalypse zombie apocalypse arrives <laughs> so i also have um one from a different two from a different lines that are very friendly and not really that protective at all like they would protect me if the if it came down to it but that's not their first response they're very smart um i have one dog right now that i've been doing rally just playing around with rally which is like a type of obedience but not as stringent and a lot to me more fun because it's always different and I've had maybe 12 lessons with him and he's got his almost his advanced titles. He just figures stuff out. He works with me. He wants to please me so badly that he'll do anything he thinks I want him to do. And that is part of the Aussie personality to me. They'll turn themselves inside out to do what you want them to do most of the time. And that's what I look for in a dog that's very biddable. We call it biddability. They want to work with you as a team. They want to team up. But Aussies, Aussies also are problem solvers and thinkers and i always i like a thinking dog which means hmm, i have to allow for a little less obedience and allow them to make their own choices because if i send them over the hill my place is all hills and tree ends then trees i can't see them so i have to go and like you figure this out on your own and then they have to think and make decisions on their own which then makes them not as obedient all the time because they don't always go together. So a lot of people like dogs that have to be told what to do. They'll walk up, lie down, go by way to up, down, way to. Mine, mine have those commands, but I want them to go and do it on their own if possible. And I think Aussies are really good at that. Um, they're very um, people oriented. I just, I don't know. I just love the breed. They just kind of connect with you. And everybody has that with their breed that they choose. They just have a connection of some sort with that breed and that's why they choose that breed. So, um, and then what I'm looking for, like I said, is a thinking dog, a problem solver, a dog that wants to work with me and that is not so hard headed that I can't get anything done because we're constantly battling. A dog that's strong in their mind um, so they can move cows, they're not afraid of cows, but is soft and gentle with sheep and babies and goats. And oh, that's another thing with the whole babies and stuff like that. Oh my goodness. Aussies and babies, baby lambs, baby anything, they're very, very in tune to that little baby, whatever really? it is. Oh, yeah. I've had dogs that were just really hard and aggressive on stock, and I just couldn't get them to stop. And you put them on brand new babies, and they're gentle and soft and calm, and they know when it's a baby. I have 
two dogs that I can't even work when I have lambs because they won't put any pressure on the lambs. I have to get my other dog, Copper, who's like, all right, move on. He's sensitive to them, but he's not emotional about it, and he'll actually put pressure <laughs> on them. But they just are very concerned about that. And I think, I think it probably goes with most herding breeds, but that stands out to me about Aussie personalities too. I had one it, Aussie, my first Aussie would, one time we were at a trial back in the day when I was 14, 15 years old, We'd all bring our dogs to a trial. They'd all run around lead, off lead, just wandering around. We'd always setting up posts and putting up pens and stuff like that. Well, Raisin disappeared, which was weird because she never left my side. And I was walking around looking for her, and there was a lady who had had a baby there. And her baby was in the carriage, and his little feet were sticking out of the carriage. And Raisin was following that carriage around, licking its toes, and just so obsessed with that baby. <laughs> They just love little babies. <laughs> so <laughs> that's fascinating. That's you, you find that to be a trait that's pretty consistent about across Australian shepherds, not just the line that you have or or the across the working ones for sure. I don't yeah deal a lot with the other lines within you know within the stock. Like if if it's not a working line, if it's not working bread, they typically don't work stock. I mean, I help people handle Aussie issues in general, but. So yes, I would say that, and I've also had Malinois out there that were the same way that, and and German Shepherds that are the same way with babies. So it may just be across herding breeds too. Okay. Huh. Now, what about physically, uh, physical traits with the Australian Shepherd, um, and in particular, working line dogs versus show and companion line dogs? Are is there a difference in physical traits? It seems like just looking at the pictures that are on your website uh, that. They do seem to be a little bit smaller framed. Is that accurate or not? So this is another one of those topics that can be very controversial. <laughs> so I will share my opinion and my opinion alone. There's actually a conversation going on around right now about um, Jean, Jean Joy Hartnagels. And the Hartnagels were one of the founding bloodlines. Their dogs, Lost or Coast Aussies, were one of the founding families of the Australian Shepherd. So she and her family have been around for a long time. And she's really pushing the concept of this a trotting drivetrain versus a sprinting drivetrain and like how the Aussies can move and change speed and make tight corners and they have this ability to be very agile and respond quickly and you know and I, I there is a difference between the working lines in my opinion and like confirmation lines per se because there are some people who have confirmation dogs that have some abilities in stock and I've seen several of them not be able to cover their stock which means they can't get up out and around and turn the heads that's when we say cover livestock so if the sheep are running away the dog has to be fast enough to go out far enough to turn their heads to turn it back to keep them from running away and some of those dogs can't do it because of their it's physically impossible they're running as fast as they can and it's not fast enough they're limited by their structure so i do agree with that the working line dogs tend to definitely be usually uh, smaller framed not as much bone I do have one that's, he's a working bred dog, 100%, but he's he's real bony and he's fast though. He has the right structure and he can move anywhere. He's like a quarter horse. He can just turn on a dime, but most of them are very much finer boned than the confirmation dogs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that helps. Any other physical trait differences or what, what um, are typical physical traits of a working Australian Shepherd? So they typically don't have that big blocky head. Um, okay. that the confirmation type dogs do. They have more of a finer head. They fit the breed standard. They have a defined stop, which is that section where their nose and their forehead uh, right. may meet. Um, I kind of think it mostly has to do with, they, typically they have different coloring as well. So you'll see the, I call, I call them old style blue dogs, where they have that really dark, dark blue not as the light, the confirmation dogs tend to have that more light, fluffy, more white on them, typically. Um, although I have a working bred dog, Copper, who has a full white collar and he looks like he's just beautiful. I mean, he's mm -hmm. beautiful, but he's got a lot of hair too. So it can vary. There's a couple of lines of working Aussies that have a lot of hair, but um, a lot of the working Aussies don't have as much hair. Some of the dogs from way back when, you know, their hair was shorter and a little bit more slick, not as fluffy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are pretty much the main, the main things there. Okay. And you can tell lines, other oh, ears too. Sometimes um, the working Aussies don't always have that flipped over perfect ear set. Some do, uh -huh. but they don't always. They have that more like we call it the flying nun ears, where they kind of go out and they <laughs> fold down a little. Sure. 
some on working lines have some prick ears too, which is not, uh, it's a fault. It's not, it's not a breed standard thing, but some of the lines do have ears that stand up, but mm -hmm. those are some of them. You can't always tell by looking at a dog, but generally you can, but not always. <laughs> right. And what about that, that characteristic Aust Australian shepherd tail, uh, kind of the, the dog's short... tail short bobtail now is that uh typically a natural thing or is docking a common practice among yeah, typically shepherds? it's not natural although aussies can be born with natural bobtail um, and okay. it can come in a variety of sizes from the, the what we see as the normal like docked look to um you know and it just looks like they have a, a tail without the tip on the end of it that's kind of how you can tell if it's a natural bobtail unless they dock it but typically docking is done i mean I've now I don't breed a lot, but I've never had a litter that had natural bob in it, so it's not very common to get natural bobs. So we dock. We, that's how they do it. And um, I don't remove dew claws anymore on my puppies, um, but I still dock tails. And there and then I imagine we'll be moving away from that soon eventually. A lot of agility people will keep these tails on because they feel like it helps with the movement and the turning and everything like that. Oh really? Okay. And then in some country. Uh, provinces in Canada and some countries in Europe, it's illegal to dock. And we can't even send over docked dogs to certain countries in Europe. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So it's a practice that is frowned upon by a lot of people, not a lot of people, but a growing number of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if I were, so I raise mostly sheep and goats, which um, are folks who have listened to several of these podcasts will know that uh, this whole podcast is a bit self-serving because I am I'm looking, I want to get my first herding dog puppy and, and I'm just like gathering information. And so, uh, I raise primarily sheep and goats. Would you talk me out of an Australian shepherd for no, no? never, I would never talk more. you out of it. because I raise, I have cattle, I have a small group of cattle, but most of the work I do is sheep and goats. And I think I, I have looked at some of your other, uh, I don't know what you call them, sister sites or whatever. Cause you yeah. do the whole goat and sheep rental thing, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, so an Aussie can do that just as well as, you know, a Border Collier or a Kelpie or whatever. I like Aussies, like I've talked to you about my personality. The personality just fits me. Um, they're kind of, I don't know, type A personality dogs and I'm a type A personality. So we go, we get along really well. High energy, high drive, you know, really, let's do it. We're up for anything. Mm -hmm. So, I, most of my stuff, I do rotational grazing. So it's kind of what you're talking about doing with the moving of goats and sheep around is rotational grazing. And my dogs do a great job doing it. And I oftentimes, I just got some Nigerian goats. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but I did. <laughs> and I love them. I didn't think I would love goats, but I love these little things. And they're just so little, but goats are like herding cats sometimes. <laughs> yeah. They kind of go where they want to go until you dog break them. And once you dog break your stock, that's the most important thing when you get a new puppy or dog that you have dog broke stock to train on because um it can really mess a young dog up if the sheep are fighting or running or not grouping together when they first start um so you might want to find somebody nearby that has an aussie or border collar something that can dog break your sheep right. um i would encourage you if you're getting a loose eyed puppy to get it dog broke by a loose eyed dog because the sheep act differently with tie dye dogs and loose eyed dogs okay they, they don't I don't know. I'm seeing different, you know, when I see border collie sheep that have been worked by a border collie at our trials, they act differently than the ones that have been worked by it on Aussie. So okay. I'm not exactly sure what to attribute that to. I have some theories, but I don't want to make anyone really mad if I say the wrong thing. So <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. But no, I wouldn't gotcha. talk you out of it at all because we do that um, every day. That's what I do. And I'll use two on my little ghost, my Nigerians. I used two for a while because they just went everywhere. They were like water. Yeah. They just slipped through everything and just went everywhere now they're really getting with the program um okay it doesn't take very long to get them with the program either sheep respond really well to a dog working them okay it's natural it's natural yeah. for them i think it's as instinctive as dogs working sheep sheep being worked by dogs well you raised a point just kind of in mentioning um goats on the go which are our targeted grazing business where you we in our affiliates across the country use goats for weed and brush control and then mm -hmm. increasingly sheep for certain purposes too um but what that means is that we're constantly we're using portable electric fencing and we're setting up small paddocks and then an adjacent small paddock and another adjacent small paddock and so really it doesn't yep. take much to get 
the livestock to move from one to the next because we they're almost out of food in this one and then they're moving to one with a bunch of food that's me immediately adjacent so one of my concerns about any herding dog would be do i have enough work for them to do to keep them busy i suspect that once i get a herding dog i'm going to think of all sorts of ways to use them that never crossed my mind before and i'm going to wonder how i ever did it without a dog right that is it's 100 percent true and let me say this that's what i do i use electric net fences and i move all over my property rotationally okay moving i rotate depending on the size of the plot and how many animals on it typically two to three days is where they stay sure. at my place where i'm at and, and i'll backtrack one minute and say that sheep and goats actually are very complementary to each other when you're grazing because sheep eat grass goats forage so mm -hmm. they eat different things so having both of them is actually to me a perfect combination of grazing management okay so when you get to the dog thing everybody tell not everybody would you go in these groups and people say oh i have raised sheep and i don't need a dog because they're bucket trained yeah well that works until it doesn't work right. because <laughs> sheep are also very suspicious sometimes like uh you're gonna try and get me in that trailer i'm not coming to you or when they have first have lambs for the first 48 hours they don't want to be they separate themselves out from the flock which is very dangerous if you let them stay out there i also have livestock guardian dogs but i bring mine up at night just because net fences fall over the wind blows them over um the little goats escape sometimes from them <laughs> wherever magically they find holes in the net fences so those are reasons why you need a dog because you know right. what if they're out there you need to catch them off the road or you need to do this and they're not going to come yep. to a bucket all the time so those are my you know yeah, yeah reasons for having a dog when things are going great you know i often don't need a dog but when things go not as planned you're mm -hmm. absolutely right i've i've had many instances they just don't happen daily but i suppose that you right. start to work your dog into your daily routine and it becomes part of your program um, exactly yeah i use mine on chickens as well i have chickens in tractors that go around as well uh -huh. and that night i put them up i i put my stuff up i have livestock guardian dogs i have three but we also have a high predator load and i just you know i put them up because fences fall over my sheep come up because the fences fall over when they're working when they're training sheep i use mine partly for training to some of them i feed them a little grain too at night just to make sure they're not wearing down because they do a lot of work but um that's why i bring mine up every day with the dog too mine do chickens and then right now i'm raising uh, 150 ducks for our national specialty <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> so the dogs are very useful there and i even one of my dogs copper i have a video on my youtube site he knows the difference between a chicken and a duck and one of the chickens got in the middle of 150 ducks and i have it on video him finding that chicken in the middle of 150 ducks and taking it out <laughs> no way <laughs> yes it's on my site he's so flipping smart that's how smart they are you know that's just yeah. like oh my gosh <laughs> and I never tra trained. How, how do you train that? He just knows. Right. So mm -hmm. it's pretty funny. Okay. Just this is. A, I'm going to ask you to make a very broad generalization here. But okay. would you say that uh, the Australian Shepherd is uh, stronger as an out in the open gathering dog or driving dog, or stronger in the pens and loading trailers and doing the up close handling work? I know a lot of people would say B. Um, that that's okay. where they're stronger. I think it all falls down to that sense of group and training. You know, they typically will not like, if you're comparing them to say a border collie, I think a border collie is probably stronger in a wide open field if you're going to have to go out farther. It's what they've been bred to do for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And so Aussies can do it. It just requires a lot more experience and training on their part to do that. They're amazing. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're amazing pen, pen work dogs, but I use mine in the field too. So I think yeah. they're a very versatile dog. And I also think that other breeds can be versatile as well, too. Um, but it's, it probably just depends on what they're exposed to and you know uh -huh. what program you, you start to use them in regularly. Yeah, and adapt. what your needs are. They're very adaptable. And I think this is true about all herding dogs. I have to give credit to them, to them all because they're all really amazing. But they're very adaptable. However you need them, that's what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, I'm going to pause here and do uh, a farm dog ritual, which is ask you in 
year long experience with a variety of farm dogs and mostly Australian shepherds. Do you have a favorite farm dog or a favorite farm dog memory you'd like to share with us? <clears throat> I have a favorite farm dog right now. His name is Copper. <laughs> I, all, I love all my dogs, but Copper is, he's cream of the crop. I mean, he's really something special. Every day I work him, I'm like, good Lord, I never taught him that. I think he's like one of those old souls that's like reincarnated because he just knows things that I've never taught him. Huh. That's that instinct, you know. But one day we had just moved to this place and my fences were sheep fences on the perimeter of one side. And so that wasn't, um, I was using some, net fencing along one side and using our perimeter fence on the other to save on the net fencing space. And it was full of weeds. So I didn't know where the holes were in that fence. And I yeah. heard my you crying and hollering and running back. One of the youths was just running back and forth. You know, she's lost her baby. It's very obvious. Right. She's lost her baby. <laughs> so I said, let's go copper. And I walked in it. Like I said, our place is really all Hills. And so she went on the other side of the hill and I didn't see her copper went running over there. By the time I got all the way over there, he had noticed that about five sheep had gone under a hole in the fence. He found the hole in the fence, went and gathered them up and brought them back to the same hole again. <laughs> and he'd never done that before. He just figured that out. And you know, you may think, well, that's easy. It's, it's not, it's not. I brought another dog out. They did it again. They found another hole later and I brought another dog out and she did what I told her, but she didn't do it on her own. She didn't figure it out. I had to say, here's the hole. Now go around. He just found the hole, figured out how to get him back and brought him back. He had never done that before. He's quite an amazing dog. Okay. And yeah. is it mostly his performance or also something endearing about his personality? He has a great personality. And the funny thing is we didn't really click right away when he was younger. I got him as a puppy. Oh, really? I liked him and everything, but there wasn't a huge like bond. It was just like whatever. And um, I actually almost sent him back for another reason. <laughs> I thought about wow. it. And I didn't, thank God, I didn't, thank God I didn't, because he is just the most amazing dog. We ended up just clicking, and yeah, he's special. He looks in your eyes, and he has that very special look. I mean, I, yeah. I'll share, can I share one more story with him? Please, when he yeah. was young, he was about a year old, so he was real young. And it was at our old place, and it was storming. We had huge storms for, it was going on for a long time. And my sheep, their feet were wet you know what happens when sheep and goats get their feet wet and they stay wet, they start having foot problems. And I thought, Oh man, I don't, didn't keep them in a barn. Typically I, I just never needed to, but it was just raining and they had all had brand new babies within 48 hours. Mm. So that whole time where they don't like to herd well, right. when they have brand new babies, they number one, don't want to stay with the flock. They want to go off on their own. And then they also don't work well because the moms are so protective of the babies. It's pouring rain. It was just pouring rain. It was supposed to hail. And I'm just like, okay, they got to come in. And we didn't have to take them far, a couple hundred yards, flip them around the fence and put them in the barn. And we got them. I mean, it took him forever, just little by little, to get those sheep together and, and a few steps at a time, take the pressure off, put the pressure on, take the pressure off. We get them up to the door of the barn. And of course, they're terrified because it's scary. It's a barn. Mm -hmm. You know, sheep, they get scared. <laughs> it's dark. It's nighttime and it's raining. And then Sheep don't work when it's nighttime and rainy. They just don't want to do anything. They want to stay there. And this one, I had just bought five ewes from the sale barn, and they had all given birth, of course. They weren't supposed to. They were supposed to be used for training, but <laughs> they gave birth. Sure. She kept running off into the dark. And he'd go get her, and she'd keep running off in the dark. Every time he'd have to go get her, the rest of the sheep would back up a little bit. All the progress we made would get lost, right? And I was just like, oh, my God. So finally I said, just leave her. He had gone out after her one more time. And I was like, just leave her. We can't, we just, we'll get her later, you know, get these ones in, then she'll go in. And I didn't see him and I didn't see him and I didn't see him. So I went around the corner and here he is, he's got the sheep and he's dragging her in. She's about a hundred pound you. He's a 45 pound dog. He dragged her in and pulled her and didn't hurt her, but he had her. He's like, you're going in. He <laughs> deposited her in the middle of the barn and he backed up and he looked at her like, don't you move. And she stood there and did not move a muscle until all the rest of the sheep came in. But I thought that was just, you can't teach a dog that, you know, yeah. he didn't leave a mark on her. He didn't hurt her at all, but he's like, you're coming in here. It was huh. really neat. He's a neat dog. <laughs> That's great. So I think the next logical line of questions is you breed also, correct? Mm -hmm. And so our audience is now is dying to know, do you have any puppies out of copper coming up anytime soon? Yeah, there's actually a litter due any moment, like any day now. So 
I think they're all spoken for, though, sadly. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, one, well, this is a great time to plug uh, stockdogtrainer.com if you would like to yeah. contact Jackie about getting on the waiting list or getting in line <laughs> for the next the next litter. Litter for cop, yeah. 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 He's special. Jackie, tell me about your uh, philosophy as a 